Spy fiction is a fascinating genre, one that tends to operate on two axes that I call Bond versus Born. The former is more larger-than-life sets of characters with fantastical technology and unflappable heroes akin to pulp adventure. The Born end of it tends to go for more grit and quote-unquote realism within spy fiction, where groups take precedent over individuals. Granted, this is a massive oversimplification of both sides, but I bring it up to show that not all spies are created equal. More often than not, spy fiction games favor the former than the latter, but it can be argued that you can do both. Enter Top Secret New World Order, a revival of the classic Top Secret that aims to satisfy both gritty and cinematic playstyles. Does it live up to that, or is it merely trading on the name of a revered TSR classic? Let's find out. Before we begin, I need to make note of a few things. Yes, I know all about the Kickstarter drama. No, I will not be comparing this to its predecessors. That would violate my policies. At around 124 pages, Top Secret New World Order is a fairly brief read. You have to refer to it as just New World Order. Spacing is plentiful, and art leans towards black and white aside from its cover. I do like the use of contrasts here, and box sizes give the book a magazine-like flow. However, I have one larger issue in the game's lack of an index. It's not as bad given the smaller book size, but it's still something I can't ignore. Worse, however, the game pulls a palladium with its table of contents being filled with lies. Absolutely shameful. Characters are assumed to be agents of ICON, the International Covert Operations Network. We'll be continuing this with Xavier Proskow. First, Attributes. We'll be opting for the random attribute method, rolling d100 for the five attributes and assigning an attribute die based on the result. Now we rolled a 71, 80, 58, 92, and 36. This makes our attributes as follows. Nerve d10, Suave d10, Intellect d8, Pulse d12, and Reflex d6. This also makes our health 40. Second, Clearance Level and Reputation. The former is an attribute that determines levels of access that an agent has. This always starts out at d4. Reputation is also a die type, represented at the start with zero, reflecting the social footprint that you have within the spy community. Third, backgrounds. These reflect your life before joining ICON and may grant you advantages in the use of certain skills. We'll go with police in this case. So whenever there's a role that's relevant to the police background, we roll that appropriate attribute die twice. Fourth is languages, which determines how many languages you speak and how fluent you are in them. For this, we roll a d4 and gain our native language and one to three more. We rolled a four in this case, so we'll have three more languages. We'll go with Italian, French, and Spanish. As for our fluency, we have a d10 on each, which will determine the language die we have. We rolled a seven, a 10, and a six. So we have a d10, a d12, and a d8. Fifth is tradecraft. This is a catch-all term for skills learned and practiced. Of the categories here, we choose three to be strong in, which use the same die type as the attribute, and one weak area, with the die type halved. This makes human int 10, sig int d4, tech d8, and combat d6. Sixth is specialized skills. These increase the relevant tradecraft die by one size each rank. We have five skills to choose from, which we'll put into handgun proficiency, cold reading, persuasion, hand-to-hand, -hand, Muay Thai, and parkour. Lastly, equipment. An agent starts with $3,000 in their starting equipment. We'll put this in a Ruger LCR, rearview sunglasses, a set of binoculars, a key logger, and a lockpick set, leaving with, with $1,505 in cash. I only have two real problems with character creation. The first is how equipment is handled. While the gadgetry is a nice touch, I think you could do with a package or two to give a kind of starting point. There's also no weapon cost list I could find, which presents its own problems. Secondly, I feel the allotted skills in contrast to the skill list could stand to be bumped a little, so the players don't feel like they're going to be pigeonholed. It's not bad per se, just incomplete. New World Order uses what it calls the Lucky 13 system. In this, you roll the attribute and tradecraft die along with any asset die from things like equipment. If the total of these die result in a 13, then the action is considered a success. If you roll the maximum result in a die, that die is a burst and explodes. On the other hand, if you roll a 1, it's considered a blowback and may add complications to the results. 
Furthermore, difficulty can be modified by increasing or decreasing the tradecraft die size. Given the few dice used, I can't help but feel that 13 is a bit high of a target number. Or more accurately, it's too reliant on modifiers to make it reasonable. In combat, an interesting setup comes into play with action points. Instead of being an extra effort system, action points are spent on, well, actions. Beyond that, many of the active combat actions are contested roles, and in my opinion, that's more reasonable than the Lucky 13 part. In a way, the mechanics here remind me of the way dice pools are generated in Cortex Plus, but this version is obviously smaller. Bottom line, despite having a fairly robust setup for combat, chases, and hacking, along with a nice adaptation of unarmed combat, I feel like it's lacking an X-factor to make characters' ability repertoire beyond skill-dependent. Again, the word here is incomplete. Despite the fact that player characters are agents of the group known as Icon, the details on who that is and what they do is barely delved into. The theme I have throughout this book, and I've mentioned several times, is incomplete, as if I'm reading a first draft instead of a finalized work. This needs to expand on the organization involved, weaponry and their costs, customization, stuff like safe houses, and so on. I can see a good amount of potential here, I really can, but it needs a few more chapters and a lot more editing before I'd be willing to sign off on it. As such, the only grade I can give this is playable. I'm sure a decent hacker could make something out of this, but as there isn't enough to pull off what's there for what it wants to be. All the more so when you compare this with other titans of spy fiction games like Spycraft 2.0 or James Bond. It's good, but not good enough. This brings TSR month to a close. While some of the games mentioned here could use a reboot, others should only have that happen when doing things the right way. Nostalgia is, after all, the sweet poison. But hopefully at least one of these was intriguing enough to try out for yourself, or even attempt at rebooting on your own time in order to keep the spirit alive. Stay frosty.